a, a walk down history lane, you already had the introduction to, uh, uh, what was it, uh, as Amelia said, the, if there are old, older women in the room, I think I'm the only, one, only older woman in the room, so, <laughs> so that's me. <laughs> uh, and so you're going to get to hear a little history. Originally, I was going to do just a, a walk through my lab, but uh, I decided since everybody else was giving science talks, why didn't I? Um, so the, uh, the question is that, that we're going to just look at is why is the optimum habitat for stony corals uh, diverged from that of the, of the larger forams with algal symbionts uh, it, on the Florida Keys Reef Tract? And uh, so I need to give you a, a bit of history here. Let's see. Um, so uh, the reef people talk a lot about shifting baselines. Um, example, a very simple example is uh, right here in Tampa Bay um, where you shift from a seagrass bed to uh, if, if you have too much nutrient, you'll put the, uh, most of the uh, primary productivity into the water column as phytoplankton. The, not enough light will penetrate to the bottom to get to the, to the seagrass, and you'll, uh, so you'll shift from uh, uh, seagrass to, to a plankton-dominated community or, or the reverse when you clean up the water, which is what happened in the 80s. Um, and in, but what we've seen with the reefs is a shift from uh, coral dominated to sponge algal dominated for the most part. Um, and uh, that's what we talk about uh, as far as shifting baselines. And interestingly enough, back in, right after I came here, Natural History Magazine asked me to write a, a, a paper on, on these larger forams uh, and what I thought they might do in the future, and they entitled my paper, Future Farmers of the Sea, <laughs> which I was so embarrassed about that I never even actually even talked about it. I, you know, sort of let it get by, but, uh, but uh, it turns out that, that uh, there's, with some controversy, we, this, this may be truer than we thought. So um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of my personal history with shifting baselines. And when I started graduate work at the University of Hawaii a long, long time ago, as, as, uh, <laughs> uh, the uh, crown-of-thorn starfish was the hot topic. Uh, and there was a, a crown-of-thorn starfish outbreak on uh, Molokai and, uh, and the co famous uh, Kaneohe Bay study was just beginning. What was ha Why was the... Why were the corals off Kaneohe Bay, uh, in Kaneohe Bay, uh, dying off and being replaced by uh, algae? So, um, at the same time, we had a, a, a geochemist at the University of Hawaii uh, Department of Oceanography. His name was Keith Chave. Uh, there may be an old enough person in there who <laughs> heard that name. <laughs> Besides me. <laughs> anyway, uh, so uh, he was developing uh, models of carbonate production of the reefs and, and other carbonate producing environments. And the larger forams were ma major producers or were major components of the carbonate systems. And nobody had a clue as to what their carbonate production was. And so... Um, so he said, why don't you work on forams? And I, so I, uh, and it was a perfect sort of combination of biology, uh, chemistry, sedimentology, and uh, uh, physical processes. Because when I got to, I, I did my undergraduate in, in uh, zoology and fell in love with ecology. And then I just, when I got to, into oceanography, I just say it's, it's, uh, Ecology on steroids. It's it's you know it's just the whole world. You got the whole world in your hands, I guess, in terms of everything relates to everything else and figuring it all out. So anyway, forams made up about a quarter of Hawaii's beach sands. These are benthic forams. A lot of people don't even know that there are benthic forams. I I find out every day, but uh, I couldn't find the things that were making up a quarter of the beach sand. I couldn't find any live ones in Kaneohe and I found very few of them off Honolulu, even though the shells were there. And it was, it was 
quickly apparent that my guys were antisocial. And so anywhere there were a lot of people, uh, there weren't the forums. And so uh, the, uh, then I got to go to uh, Palau uh, for a year and a half uh, and did my, uh, some of my dissertation research or did a good deal of my dissertation research there. And of course, I got to dive the, the, some of the best reefs in the world for, <laughs> for a year and a half. And uh, not only were the reefs amazing, but so were the symbiote bearing forams. They were, there were beaches that were like almost pure foram shells. And, and uh, this, these are, uh, uh, let's see. Ah, there we go. Uh, these little stars here, those are all live forams living right in this algal uh, mat that's right behind the algal ridge on this little uh, reef here. So, um, and these, they uh, still sell bottles of, of these forams at the kiosks in Okinawa. Uh, I'll show you some if you want, but because of pollution and one thing and another, they now mix it with, with colored beads or something. But I have some of the original sample, or, you know, or from 10, 20 years ago that, uh, that they actually gave you a, a bottle of, or you sold you for a dollar or whatever, a bottle of, of, of forams uh, that, that was just beach sand. Okay, so then I came to, to the Caribbean uh, and uh, the, the reefs all pretty much looked to be stressed. And uh, the forams basically agreed. The densities were not nearly as great, and I mean, there we have a, a pretty assemblage of, of this is a, a Natasha uh, Mendez Ferrer took this picture. We have some beautiful forams, but uh, um, the forams typically, these symbiote bearing forams, uh, thrive in clear, nutrient poor waters. So, the, basically, the clearer the waters, the better the foram assemblage. And uh, the smaller species, the non-symbiont bearing, uh, tend to live where there's relatively abundant, somewhat more abundant food resources. And then we have a suite of, of stress tolerance. And we've developed this whole scheme into a, what we call the 4M index for uh, reef monitoring and assessment. Uh, and uh, it's being used now uh, in areas all around the world, including it's written into the uh, Great Barrier Reef Park Authority uh, water quality monitoring program. But uh, that that's all kinds of comes from the long-term decline of, of our Florida reefs. And this is, most of you have seen this series of pictures before, and there's actually more that are even worse because it's kind of the melting of the, of the reefs as the, as the corals die and then the uh, bioerosion sets in and, and you kind of melt away the reefs. So, uh, and what we uh, documented early on was that uh, um, the, uh, we had some samples that were taken by other people in the, in the early 60s and, uh, and emphysagina was the dominant forum, and, uh, which is the dominant for the uh, Florida Reef Tract. And uh, when we went and sampled in uh, 19... The, 91, 92, we found that the that these smaller forms were were dominating. The water was was good enough that we these you know these pollution really severe pollution indicators weren't there. Although you can find them like in Biscayne Bay or uh, some other uh, near the uh, populated areas. Um, and the, I was able to get a, this set of samples in 1982 that turned out they're somewhere in intermediate. Um, but in those, that 91, 92 um, collection was an important thing. But you know, just the, some causes of, of decline of coral cover that, that people talk about all the time. Things, people in the, especially in the 80s, talked a lot about sedimentation. The sediments coming onto the patch reefs or on the fringing reefs were were causing the decline. And, and then somebody, some rabble rouser who, who thought that, that, that water quality was important, 
kept talking about nutrients and reefs. Uh, could nutri- and, and I was even called unethical for suggesting that nutrients were a problem on coral reefs uh, back in around 1990 uh, by, uh, because I couldn't prove that nutrients were harmful to coral reefs. And that particular person was taking, was, was consulting for Ocean Reef Club <laughs> at the time, so I was the unethical one. But um, overfishing problems are certainly uh, involved, and uh, we've got, and in the 90s, it was just there was a new disease every week, it seemed like, that somebody was reporting. Uh, maybe not quite every week, but practically some summers almost every month. And uh, then... Uh, actually, my friend and colleague Walt Jap, who is retired from the Florida Fish and Wildlife, was one of the first people to write about bleaching events and the uh, bleaching events in '72. I believe the big bleach, uh, the big El Nino, wasn't there a major El Nino in '72 and or '73, '72, '72, '73, right? And then again in in '78. So there were some some localized bleaching events in the Keys in the 70s, and then the 1983, and then the 1987, and, 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 the, and now it's you know, somewhere every year. Big one going on in the Keys right now. I mentioned the crown of thorn starfish in the Indo-Pacific, in the Caribbean. We had the decline of the, of the diadema, the diadema die off in 1983. Um, uh, destabilized echinoderm populations is clearly an issue uh, I tried to put that in a paper one time, and they go, oh, you don't have any proof of that. And I'm like, like Crinothorn starfish, diadema. Uh, well, anyway, uh, <laughs> you you got to give in sometimes. But anyway, uh, the, obviously the increase in coral cover. And what of these are going to impact the larger forams? Well, sedimentation, but sedimentation isn't really an issue in the Florida Keys. Decline in water quality up to a point, but in some cases the... Uh, Increased algal cover can, can be a positive factor for the forams. Here's the forams uh, from a, just an algal sample that we, we shook out. And so, um, and then in that 1991 study, we discovered uh, bleaching in these forams. And uh, that size difference isn't an isn't a, uh, artifact. It's, uh, it's a pro- what we call a progressive degenerative problem, and it's, it's very interesting biologically how they can keep growing, uh, even though they're uh, bleaching. But anyway, so what's bleaching? It's, uh, whether it's coral or, or forams or tridactin, for that matter, it's, it's the loss of the symbionts or the loss of the symbiont pigments. Um, these, these forams that I work with uh, are, occur worldwide. Uh, down to a depth sometimes as deep as 100 meters uh, and in, in very clear water. And um, they have about a 45 million year history. So they actually evolved back when, if you were here for Amelia's talk, uh, Dr. Chevenel's talk, uh, she was talking about when the CO2 was highest. <laughs> they actually evolved back then. So, so they actually uh, should be, or, or we've seen that they can handle high CO2 pretty well. Anyway, uh, it can be it can be the mild to severe. I actually saw it for the first time uh, in laboratory experiments in the 1980s when I was trying to figure out what were the optimum conditions to raise my forearms in in the laboratory, and that's when I first uh, had some uh, some uh, what we call modeling that kind of this stage of of of, of symbiont loss, and uh, then in 1991 we went. Uh, sampling in, in May, early May, and uh, the forams seemed fine, and then in, sampled again in late June, and I had meetings in Miami area, or the Keys area, uh, two in a row, and I, so my students came down and we sampled in between um, the two meetings, and, and the student that was, that the samples were actually four, brought the samples back, and uh, and when I got back from my meeting, it's like, there's something wrong with the forearms. They look really weird. They just, they, they just, they, you know, and I, my first reaction was, oh, students, you know, you just can't, <laughs> you just can't trust them with a, with a bucket of forearms, with a cooler of forearms. <laughs> that wasn't true at all. It turned out that uh, what we were seeing was the very onset, the very first stages of the, of the what 
turned out to be, well, we see it all the time now. And so, you know, people say, oh, well, how do you know it wasn't happening before? Or how do you know you're not doing it to them when, when you sample? Well, first of all, I got to do an Aquarius mission and took a microscope down and looked at them underwater, ones that I collected underwater and looked at them inside the habitat, and they looked just like the ones that I brought to the surface. So I was pretty sure that I hadn't done it to them. But reviewers are sometimes a little vicious. I had one recently who asked me to define CO2. <laughs> Um, so, anyway, so we had this 1991 onset of bleaching in the summer of 91. We went back in, in September, because we weren't quite sure what, we were, what was going on, but we had this big sampling effort in, in September, and uh, about 80% of the adults were, were really either very modeled to, to, to quite bleached. And then the sexual reproduction, which tends to take place in the fall, uh, must not have been at all successful because the population just plummeted. And boy, did we have to scrub a lot. We scrub rubble to get the little foramps off. And boy, did we have to scrub a lot of rubble for a year uh, to, to, to get any foramps during that first couple of years. Or first, uh, um, and uh, so then we... Made a lot of trips to the Keys during the 1990s. Uh, my students and I got a lot of diving time. And, uh, and so we, we actually sampled monthly from, uh, 92 to, from May of 1992 to uh, uh, summer 19, or end of 1996 and then quarterly uh, at various times since then, not just uh, to 99. And so we have population responses, and then I mentioned some environmental links. Just to show you quickly uh, some of the things that we see, uh, I had a student, uh, Helen Talge, who worked on, uh, she did cytological work, and um, this, is, this is an individual chamber, and the symbionts, these are diatom symbionts, and they tend to be around the periphery of the chamber where they can get the most light and... Uh, and here, uh, these are empty, what we call pour cups. The ins the, if you look at the inside of a shell of one of these forearms, it looks like an egg case because it, it's uh, little holders <laughs> for each of these symbionts. And you, you see that uh, here in the, in the outside of the, of the chamber. But there's one kind of deteriorating symbiont there, but you can also see that the, that the, the uh, cytoplasm is quite damaged. And she couldn't work with anything that was, that was uh, extensively bleached. It had to be mild to maybe a little moderately bleached. Otherwise, the cytoplasm was so uh, uh, it, it, there wasn't enough integrity to the cytoplasm to even section it. Um, we saw all kinds of, of reproductive damage. This is a, in, the, in the asexual reproductions, we don't see the sexual that's a whole other story, but this is a, a nice, healthy sexual reproduction, or asexual reproduction, and here is some of the things that we saw happening. Sometimes they wouldn't uh, even calcify. Sometimes they would, we would just get a few really odd-looking things, and in the field, we were seeing changes in coiling ratios, and if in mild conditions, we were seeing changes in coiling ratios, and in uh, extreme cases, we were seeing uh, a lot more deformed specimens. And then we were there was all kinds of, of damage to the shells, not just deformities, but the predators had figured out that these things were, were weakened and, and good to eat. And so uh, a friend of mine who works with hermit crabs thinks that these are, uh, that the, they're holding on to them and the, her little tiny hermit crabs are breaking them off, eating them like, you know, like we eat Oreos where you break off the edges <laughs> or a, a cookie of some sort. Um, and uh, there's some other issues here, but anyway, and another student, uh, Strand Toller, over at uh, who's now over at SRI, uh, showed uh, that that the, the some calcification anomalies that were were really characteristic. And the the weird thing about this is is that in the in the healthy one, uh, everything it. You don't see as much calcification as you do in this bleached one, 
But what, what happens is, is that they kind of lose control. The, they're not producing enough organic matrix that they lose control of the calcification process of what seems to be happening. The only species I've ever uh, uh, named is this little predatory 4M that we discovered. And I had a, a high school student did her science fair project on, on prey selectivity with these things. She wanted more money than I got in research dollars that year <laughs> from her going to the International Science Fair and, and so forth. But uh, uh, anyway, so, uh, but is the cause water temperature? Well, uh, no. <laughs> and I, I one time, I put something like this in a, in a proposal one time and they said, well, clearly the bottom temperature, uh, the water temperature is causing the bleaching, except that if you're going to do cause and effect, the bleaching is causing the temperature to get warm. Because <laughs> uh, the, the bleaching is preceding the uh, temperature curve in, in uh, those cases. On the other hand, uh, it, it uh, is definitely more consistent with uh, the solar radiation cycle. And... and uh, We saw very distinct transparency differences between the reefs, between Conk Reef and Tennessee Reef, which were the two reefs we sampled during, uh, extensively during the 1990s. And Tennessee Reef is almost always, uh, has more color dissolved organic matter and other things coming out of Florida Bay. Conk Reef is usually much clearer. Uh, Conk Reef, we saw bleaching all the way down to 30 meters. At Tennessee Reef, they tended to be uh, healthier at their, our 18 meter site. We didn't even have a 30 meter site at, at Tennessee Reef. Um, and in the our eight meter, six to eight meter site, uh, uh, we tended to see when it was good, it was very, very good. And when it was bad, it was horrid. They would, because when it was clear, they would crash. And when it was, when the water was, when there was enough sea dump to protect them, they seemed to be doing better. And so uh, we also saw an early summer, well, we saw an early summer peak in the prevalence and a late summer peak in the severity of the, of, of the bleaching because it would accumulate over time in the individuals. Uh, the decline in prevalence and severity occurred, we recorded that from the onset until 1998. Uh, we had another peak in 1998 and then it's been uh, prevalent, especially in the clearer waters. Uh, and uh, and then the the chronic bleaching that we see now and or